Good afternoon. I'd like to take this time to take a closer look at the Andrew Jackson administration. So I'm going to go ahead and share my screen and we'll get started. So we're going to start with the presidential election of 1824 and Jackson's alleged corrupt bargain. During the presidential election of 1824, four candidates were running for the office of the presidency. Most notably, John Quincy Adams, who is the son of the former president John Adams, Andrew Jackson, who was a former congressman, and Henry Clay, who is currently the Speaker of the House. When the votes were counted, although Jackson had won the majority of the popular and electoral votes, he did not earn the required number of electoral votes to automatically become president. Because no candidate had the required number of electoral votes, Congress would ultimately decide who would become the next president. Congress would have to choose between Andrew Jackson and John Quincy Adams. Henry Clay, who was currently the Speaker of the House of Representatives, had a considerable amount of power in Congress. And although he was not completely sold on the idea of John Quincy Adams becoming president, Henry Clay was firmly against Andrew Jackson becoming president. Henry Clay would use his power and influence to convince Congress to choose John Quincy Adams as the next president. Once Adams was in office, he would appoint Henry Clay as his Secretary of State. Now, although we don't have any proof that a corrupt bargain took place, Jackson claimed that a corrupt bargain had been agreed to by John Quincy Adams and Henry Clay. Jackson claimed that Henry Clay gave his support and used his influence to get John Quincy Adams elected as president. And in return, John Quincy Adams awarded Henry Clay with the position of Secretary of State within his cabinet. Now, again, although there's no proof that a corrupt bargain took place, we do know that Jackson's claim would contribute to him winning the presidential election in 1828. And so here you see the uh, results of the 1828 election. Andrew Jackson won the presidential election of 1828 and he would serve as president from 1829 to 1837. He was the seventh president of the United States, the first president not to come from Virginia or Massachusetts. He came from Tennessee. He is considered to be the first modern president in American history. He felt as though the executive branch was superior to both the legislative and the judicial branch. In many ways, Jackson expanded the power of the presidency by introducing the spoil system, the kitchen cabinet, and the pocket veto. By practicing the spoil system, Jackson fired many federal employees and replaced them with his supporters and friends. Some of those employees that Jackson fired had been in those positions since the George Washington administration. Now, obviously, the problem with the spoils system is that Jackson did not hire people based on their ability to do their job, but instead, Jackson hired people in which he could control or influence. Jackson also implemented the kitchen cabinet. The kitchen cabinet was a group of advisors and supporters that existed outside the presidential, uh, the traditional presidential cabinet, excuse me. Jackson not only vetoed more than all of the six presidents before him combined, 
that he also implemented what is known as the pocket veto. Jackson simply allowed for a bill that he was not in favor of to die, uh, meaning last after 10 days after it leaves Congress. And by letting the bill die, he essentially denied Congress the opportunity to override his veto. Now we're going to briefly talk about the Indian Removal Act of 1830 and the U.S. Supreme Court case of Worcester versus Georgia. The passage of the Indian Removal Act of 1830 and the Jackson administration represents one of the most heartbreaking chapters in American history. Jackson is not only considered to be one of the most, if not the most controversial presidents, but he is also considered to be one of the most racist presidents in U.S. history. Prior to the Indian Removal Act of 1830, the five civilized tribes, which was the Choctaw, Cherokee, Creek, Seminole, and Chickasaw, lived primarily within the southeastern area of the country. After the Indian Removal Act of 1830 was signed by Jackson, the Choctaw, the Chickasaw, the Creek, and the Seminole were forced to move west of the Mississippi River to the state of Oklahoma. The Cherokee Nation, which lived primarily within the state of Georgia, decided to challenge the federal government. In the U.S. Supreme Court case of Worcester versus Georgia, John Marshall, who at that time was the Chief Justice of the U.S. Supreme Court, ruled in favor of the Cherokee Nation and argued that the Cherokee had the right to stay on their homeland and that the federal government did not have the right to force them to leave. Although the Constitution clearly states that it is the president's responsibility to enforce the laws, meaning enforce the U.S. Supreme Court's ruling, Jackson did not protect the Cherokee Nation and their land. As a result of Jackson's refusal to enforce the laws, the Cherokee Nation was forced off of their land and forced to move west of the Mississippi River to the state of Oklahoma. Over 4,000 Cherokee Native Americans died as a result of the Trail of Tears. After studying the history of my family, I learned that my great-great-grandmother on my father's side was a survivor of the Trail of Tears. Jackson not only failed to do his job as president, but he committed crimes against humanity. Now we're going to look at Jackson's war against the Second Bank of the United States. If politics is personal, it is very personal to Andrew Jackson. Jackson had a very strong hatred when it came to Henry Clay, and his hatred uh, had come about partly due to Clay's role within the presidential election of 1824 and the presidential election of 1828. In an effort to discredit Jackson to ensure a second term for John Quincy Adams, Henry Clay, during the presidential campaign of 1828, publicly shared the fact that Rachel Jackson, Jackson's wife, had been married at the same time that she and Jackson were courting. Although she eventually divorced her first husband, and married Andrew Jackson. This was humiliating to Rachel. Jackson always felt that her death prior to him taking office after winning the presidential election of 1828 was a result of this national embarrassment at that time. Jackson blamed Henry Clay for starting it, and he essentially blamed John Quincy Adams for not shutting it down when he had the power to do so. He 
he personally blamed them for the death of his wife. Therefore, anything that they, meaning Henry Clay or John Quincy Adams, attached themselves to, Jackson would aim to destroy. Henry Clay, knowing that Jackson was against a third charter for the Bank of the United States, decided to run during the presidential election of 1832 in favor of the third charter of the bank. That Clay was under the impression that if he was in support of the third charter, he would be elected as the eighth president of the United States. And on, on the side that Jackson would only serve one term. Henry Clay, as Speaker of the House, easily got a third charter passed, up. in fact, years before the second charter would expire. And the third charter, whenever it reached Jackson, Jackson would veto it. Not only did Jackson win the presidential election of 1832, but he also managed to crush a third charter in support of the largest corporation at that time, America. Although the second bank of the United States still had four years on its charter, Jackson was determined to destroy it from the inside out. Jackson asked his first Secretary of Treasury to remove all the money out of the bank, and they refused. And then they were fired by Jackson. Then Jackson asked his second Secretary of Treasury to remove the money from the bank. They refused, and they were also fired by Jackson. Jackson would ask his third Secretary of Treasury Roger Taney to remove the money from the bank, and he would. Eventually, the money that was removed from the second bank of the United States was placed in smaller state banks. And as a result of Jackson destroying the largest corporation in the United States and placing the money that it had in smaller banks, Martin Van Buren would have to deal with an economic crisis during his presidency. Along with destroying the bank, Jackson destroyed the reputation of not only Henry Clay, but also the president of the Second Bank of the United States, Nicholas Biddle. Now we're going to briefly talk about the nullification crisis of 1832. The nullify, excuse me, to nullify means to argue that something is invalid. The motivation behind the nullification crisis of 1832 was that South Carolina and the citizens of argued that the tariff of 1828 and the tariff of 1832 was too costly and essentially benefited everyone except them. The state of South Carolina decided to nullify or make invalid the tariff of 1828 and the tariff of 1832. Jackson essentially threatened a civil war if South Carolina continued to nullify both of these federal laws. And eventually a compromise was met between the state of South Carolina and the federal government. And that compromise said that South Carolina had to continue to pay that tariff, both tariffs, and abide by the law. But over time, the prices of those tariffs would slowly go down. It's important to note that the first state to try and nullify a federal law was the same state that was the first to secede from the Union in 1860, South Carolina. So, I hope this video has provided you with more information in regards to the Jackson administration. I thank you for your time. Stay safe, stay healthy, and I'll see you next time. Bye.